to talk on the Gyoji chapter of the Shogogen. So, um, usually I do that in Japanese first and it's still my hope that one day uh, we can study uh, the text in Japanese uh, because although it can be helpful to also read it in the English translation uh, because then you get a different perspective. Um, if you don't have the original and only have the translations, um, it's a little bit like somebody tells you how Mount Fuji looks from the east and somebody else tells you how it looks from the west and then you have to imagine how it might re look in reality but you never see the real mountain. So it's definitely an advantage if you can also read the text um, in the original and then you understand where all these translations come from and why they differ sometimes because you can read uh, the same sentence in different ways but uh, tonight everybody speaks uh, English so tonight I will talk in English only and I hope that uh, sooner or later your Japanese improves to a point where you can also follow my Japanese talks. Um, yeah, first of all um, about the Gyoshi chapter, I've been talking about this for two years or so, I think already. There's two parts. The second part where we are right now is the older part. So Dogen wrote the second part first, starting with Bodhidharma. And now we are through with uh, the story about Bodhidharma and we've reached the second patriarch. And the newer part is the first part. And the first part starts with uh, Shakyamuni and Mahakasho. And before that, Dogen Zenzi says uh, something that's um, quite well important. Um, this is the expression dokan um, which also in the west in zen circles it's not a super famous word but some people might have heard it it means the ring of the way and well this is the way and uh, the word do is also translation of bodhi so it also means enlightenment uh, kan is the ring, like in Osaka, the loop line is called Kanjo-sen. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's closed, it's a loop. And what Dogen Zenji means that the way or enlightenment um, has the structure of the way uh, of a ring. He means 
that uh, what in Japanese would be hoshin, which means uh, awakening the mind, arousing the mind. Mm, some people de define hoshin as uh, the thought that you want to get enlightenment, seeking for enlightenment, the mind that seeks for enlightenment. Sometimes um, used as an English translation for Hoshin, but um, if you look at the actual word hot, Hoshin, which is short for Hotsubo it means to arouse enlightened mind. So nowhere in here the seeking is mentioned. Dogen Zenji himself uh, defines Hoshin in his works in different ways. In the Gakudo Yojinshu, he first says, uh, Hotsubo Daishin or Hotshin means to understand impermanence and to see impermanence. And what he means there is that actually we have only this moment. Um, our life is impermanent. We're living in impermanence. And Dogen Zenji says if you really understand that you have only this one moment, then you will practice as if your head was on fire. Um, in other works, like for example in the Tenzo Kyokun, he mentions in the end three minds. Uh, the joyful mind, parental mind and big mind. These three minds are also basically examples of, of Hoshin. To practice with a joyful mind means to be well grateful for the fact that you are here right now and you are actually standing in the kitchen cooking for the Sangha of practitioners. Parental mind means to let go of this thought of oh shit, it's Hosan today in such nice weather and everybody's enjoying themselves outside and I have to be the tensor <laughs> again. Why do I have to cook for these assholes? And I spend the whole day <laughs> to cook lunch and they eat it in five minutes, ten minutes, it's over and, and they wash the dishes and nobody says thank you, nobody says oh this was great. Um, and parental mind means to let go of that. Parental minds, or um, in Japanese, it's loshin, old mind. But Dogen Zenji says old mind means the mind of a father or a mother that cooks for their baby. And they don't expect the baby to say, oh, thank you, mother. It was so delicious that you feed me your, your milk from the breast. They just drink. But the mother is happy when the baby drinks. So the preferably the tenzo should have this mind that you're just happy that you can cook for these people and they eat it and you don't uh, compare yourself as we usually do like oh last tenzo uh, when i had to work in the rice field it was raining and the last guy here did good yet there in the kitchen when i was doing that hard work and now when I'm the Tenzo, it's super nice weather and there's Hosan and, and why do I have to be Tenzo now? I would have preferred to be five days ago. You always pre um, um, compare yourself with the others. You always think you have it worse and, and, and uh, last cycle we uh, that Tenzo used all of the tomatoes and now I don't have the tomatoes anymore. I would have used like to use some tomatoes as well and, and so forth and so forth and so forth. Uh, Roshin means you forget that and you're happy if the baby drinks the milk and you're happy about that. Daishin means to have a mind that's as big as the ocean or as high as a mountain and why does uh, the mountain become so high? Dogen Zenji asks, why is the ocean so big? Because the ocean accepts any river that flows into it. The, the ocean doesn't choose and say, oh, I, I like this river, that river is okay, but the other rivers I don't like. And the mountain, if the wind is blowing and uh, transports the leaves on the mountain, the mountain says, oh, don't, don't come here, don't, I don't want any dust, I don't want any leaves on, on me. The uh, mountain allows all the leaves to settle on himself and that's why the mountain becomes so big, that's why the ocean becomes so uh, great. Um, so those are also examples of Hoshin. And then in the later part of the Dogen Zenji, uh, of the Shobo Genzo, Dogen Zenji writes this chapter Hotsubo Daishin, which is about body mind, arousing body mind. And there he says to arouse body mind to, is to 
have the wish to help others before yourself. It's the wish to uh, lead others to nirvana before you reach nirvana yourself. Jimmy Tokudo Sendota is the Japanese the phrase for that. So uh, you're not even enlightened yourself. You haven't found nirvana yourself, but you want to help others reach that first. And Dogen Zenji says that's Hoshin. So that's a pretty high standard of Hoshin compared to the usual translation. Hoshin means to uh, seek for enlightenment. Um, that's maybe the easiest ex accessible explanation. That's why it's often used also in English books. Uh, you realize you're in suffering, uh, your life sucks, Mm. If you really tried hard, you could probably make it at school, you could find a job, you could find a f girlfriend and marry and have kids. But at the end, what is it all good for? In 50 years from now, you're retired, maybe you're still married to your wife, your kids have kids of themselves, you have grandchildren, maybe you have a house somewhere in the suburbs. But what? But what? Um, you will still get older with each day, become sick and die. Is that the life you want to live? And that scenario is kind of the best scenario that you can have. It could have could be also the case you never find a job, you never find a girlfriend. Uh, your kids become sick and die before you. You might. Uh, be born in a uh, area where there's war or a war could start any time uh, in Europe or in America or here in Japan. Uh, it's kind of the best scenario is that you're 70, married with grandchildren, but still, yeah, why have I been born into this world? What, What is this? And even in the best scenario, you don't know why you've been born. With each day you get one day older, you get sick and you die if you want it or not. And people who come to Buddhism in one way or the other probably ask themselves this question. What can I do about this life and the suffering? that's involved with it. Why do I suffer? Where does the suffering come from? Is there anything I can do about it? I can't change the fact that I've been born into this world. Now that I'm here, what I, do I do with this life? How do I want to live? So that could be also chosen as one easy to access definition of Hoshin. Life sucks, but maybe there's something I can do about it. Maybe there's some solution to this. Um, so that's one thing, Hoshin. Then the next thing is Shugyo. In Japanese, you would write it like this. Shugyo uh, practice. Mm. You look for a solution, now you have to do something about it. In our case, practice would mean Zazen at the center, but then everything else, like uh, the meals, Samu, uh, taking a bath, enjoying a Hosan, a free day, all of that is practice. The 24 hours of the day, you focus on your life and yeah, how do I want to use these 24 hours of the day? Uh, today is October 31st of 2018 and you have that day only once in your life, it will never come back. Uh, there are only a little less than six hours left of that day. How do I use these six days? And trying to use them fully, that's practice. And then um, there's a word which I can't write in characters because there are a little bit complicated, but then in Japanese it would be Bodai, which comes from the Indian Bodhi. And 
Bodhi means, well, awakening, enlightenment. So at that point, according to the easy to access definition, you're looking for enlightenment. You arouse the mind that tries to get enlightened. Here you practice hard and at this stage, the third stage, third stage, you finally reached it. You awaken. Oh, that's the answer. There it is, Bodai. And last comes Japanese Nehan, which stands for Nirvana. So, um, if you say Nirvana in Japanese, probably most Buddhists will understand you, but the Japanese word for Nirvana is Nehan. That's what hmm, the state you reach or what you enter after awakening. It, it might be a kind of, um, you could ask, well, are these two actually different? Traditionally, Probably yes. So traditionally, uh, the Buddha awakened under the Bodhi tree at age 36. But permanent nirvana, he entered. So uh, uh, what's it called? Pari nirvana? Pari. Pari nirvana. Ne? In, in Japanese, Hatsune. Para nirvana. Pari nirvana is the complete Nirvana, complete, is uh, being complete extinguished, just like a uh, torch that you blow out, and there's no more suffering. And the Buddha entered that Pari Nirvana, complete Nirvana, at age 80 when he died. Until then, of course, he was already an awakened person, he was a Buddha, but he probably still had sufferings, so, so he had, was hungry uh, when he had eaten for a while. Uh, when he died, he died of food poisoning. He was suffering at that time. Um, he wasn't a slave of his delusions anymore, but the complete nirvana uh, is what the Buddha reached after or when he died. And according to traditional Orthodox Buddhist understanding, it means that he wasn't reborn. Everybody else of us will be reborn if we don't attain Bodhi in this life. And then we have the next life to try our luck once more and try to do it better. And if one fine day we reach Bodhi and become Buddhas, then we will attain Nirvana and will not be reborn in again. So anyway, you start here, stage one. Uh, you realize there's a problem. I don't want to be a slave of this game of deluded people anymore. I don't want to be part of that game that the deluded people play anymore. Um, I'll try to use the time of my life in a different way. I'm going to practice and I will find Bodhi, enlightenment, and finally be released from suffering. All of this will be extinguished and I'll be uh, in Nirvana. And when Dogen Zenji says uh, Dokan, the ring of the way, what he says, is that these four are actually arranged like a ring. If this is Hoshin, then here is Shugyo, here is Bodai, and here is Nehan. So if you go to Osaka, this would be Umeda. Osaka station is in Umeda. And if you're going to go to Shin Imamiya, there's two ways you can go. You can go east to Kyobashi, Tennoji, and then here's Shin Imamiya, or you can go the other way around. Nishikujo, Bentensho, uh, Shin Imamiya. Uh, you can go either way, but if you go the traditional way, you would start with Hoshin, Shugyo, Bodai, Nehan. And Dogen Zenji says this, this is not the end. What comes after Nirvana? After Nirvana, you do Hoshin again and you practice again Bodhi, reach Bodhi again, and there's another Nirvana. And we all think that at one point we have this realization, I suffer, I need to do something about it. I need to change my life. Where does this thought come from? According to Dogen, again, this comes from Nirvana and Bodhi. Even though you, nobody thinks when they come to Antaji, I'm enlightened. 
you wouldn't have come here if not something had aroused this mind in you. I need to change my life. So Dogen Zenji says, actually, the moment you think, I need to do something about my suffering, I need to change my life. That's already nirvana. It's kind of a thought that's painted on the canvas of nirvana, your mind is that canvas of nirvana or enlightenment. Uh, you're not aware of that at that point, maybe. At that point, you think, I'm, I still need to get it. I still need to get it. But actually, you wouldn't have that thought if Bodhi wouldn't support it. It's kind of, it's growing on Bodhi. So that's how Dogen Zindi starts this chapter, Yosi chapter. Hoshin, Shugyo, Bodai, Nehan are, actually, there's no gap in between he says there there's no gap between these four they are like a ring they occur together and another thing uh, that he says there um, to practice in this way to practice this ring it's not something that you do through your own force it's not also also not something that uh, others force you to do you don't do it forcefully you don't fight to practice this ring of the way. Others don't force you to do it, but rather it's, um, well, a little bit like the Kanjo Sen in Osaka. You're sitting in the train, and the moment you wake up, you're actually on the train. Uh, the ring of the way transports you. And then what he writes in the whole um, Yoji chapter, in a way, it often it sounds quite different from that. So he emphasizes how much of a hard time the patriarchs had and how uh, many hardships they endured, how cold it was in the winter, how poor the food was. Um, that it leaked through the roof when it was raining, that they didn't know what to wear, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we need to learn from the, from the patriarchs. And interesting um, that what most of us interests most, how did these guys get enlightened? Like at one point the master shouted and the student, oh, that's it. Uh, what you find in the Koan books, that's always missing. So Dogen Zenji, he, from patriarch to patriarch, he emphasizes that for years they only picked up, uh, I don't know, nuts that had fallen from the trees and, and, and uh, sat in the mountains without meeting anybody. And it sounds like, like very hard practice. And, and it, it sounds that uh, they made a big effort but then uh, what i talked about last uh, month um, after bodhidharma um, and the second patriarch dogen zenji comes to this point where he talks about uh, paying the repaying the debt is that the english translation i think repaying the debt of gratitude repaying the debt of gratitude in japanese it's just horn yeah we should unfriend when we're paying Pardon? a debt of gratitude to the patriarch. We should unfailingly repay our debt of gratitude to the patriarch. Okay, so yeah, paying, repaying our debt of gratitude to the patriarchs. And that's a very important concept uh, for Dorian that I think appeared in the chapter for the first time. Um, last month until then uh, for many months it just sounded like hey think about how hard it was must have been for bodhidharma think about how hard it must have been for the buddha or maha kashapa and all the other patriarchs if it has been so hard for them you have to do even more but then now he gets to the point where he says well look you're practicing already. Uh, tomorrow you will be doing a session for five days. You will be sitting on the Zafu. Why is that possible? How is that possible? 
that you're doing that. And it happens from time to time that somebody disappears during a session because it's too hard for them. But most people miraculously that they do it, even though in the middle of the session, usually it feels like pretty hard and everybody thinks about it probably more than once or twice that maybe I should rather leave. Uh, how can I be so stupid that I sit here for five days when I could have fun with my girlfriend or you know, be in Shinima Mia in, in Osaka uh, or go to the beach in Hamasaka, whatever. Why do we do this? And when I ask what is it good for, the answer is it's good for nothing. Why, why would I do it? And still, almost everyone does it for five days and then they do it again the next month. How is that possible? And Dorgan's answer is, well, because we're sitting in this train that transports us around the ring of the way. It's because of uh, the practice that has been maintained from Buddha to Buddha, from patriarch to patriarch. So when we practice, it's not that we try to gain something that's still ahead, but actually we're, we're pushed by the Buddhas and patriarchs and we are repaying our debts. We are pulling a train that's been circling around here since the beginning of time. Well, or pulling is not maybe not, not the right way. We're, we're, we're continuing. We're continuing. Uh, we've been sitting in this train forever and now it feels like maybe now I'm the locomotive. I have to pull. I have to pull. But actually the other cars from behind, they've been pushing you all the time. Um, so that means repaying the debt to the patriarchs. We wouldn't be here without the patriarchs. We wouldn't be here without something that brought us here. And this uh, realization that actually there's something that, that's carrying you, that you're s sitting in a train. Uh, sitting in a train that goes from enlightenment to enlightenment. It goes from practice to practice. Um, that has something to do with that story that I love to repeat over and over again on the third day of session. You've heard it over and over in case you die there's still space for you in the graveyard but you don't want to die on the other hand you can can't fight anymore you don't want to escape what can you do well let's see what happens and you sit there and in the worst case you might die and that's when you realize, oh, it's actually very easy. I don't have to fight. I don't have to escape. If I die, I will die. And until then, I'm going to sit. And even though you might have thought, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. This is going to kill me. I can't make it till the end of the session like this. You realize, oh, but I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting just fine. The pain is there, but the pain doesn't kill me. I'm still breathing. Uh, there's enough oxygen for me to breathe. Even Munyo had enough oxygen to breathe. <laughs> um, there's water. Sometimes it's a little bit dirty. There's enough water. And the Tenzo is cooking for us. Tenzo might be uh, complaining uh, about his fate having to be the Tenzo during Seshi. Sometimes the other guys, uh, they are actually envious of the Tenzo. I wish I could be the Tenzo now. I have to sit. I'm in pain. The Tenzo, they can stretch their legs. It's whatever. Uh, at the end of the day, you might realize there's really nothing to complain about. What did I complain about all the time? Um, once you stop fighting, you stop 
escaping, you stop comparing your fate with the fate of others, you stop comparing today with yesterday and tomorrow, when no comparison is possible in the first place. You might realize that things are just fine, but that realization, where does it come from? And when you realize in, in that moment, I'm just sitting and I'm doing fine. Where does this um, power to continue to sit come from? From my experience, you make that realization in a moment where you've already given up. So, so you stop fighting. You stop fighting and in that moment you realize, but I'm sitting. So it, yeah, at least for me, it feels like this uh, marathon runner who thought I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. And in the moment you give up, you realize, oh, I'm sitting in a train here. I was running. Sawaki Roshi uh, uses this example of, of somebody who's running in a train so that they might get to Satori faster. He says it's, it's like, like you're running in a train. Um, there's no need to run. There's no need to run. Uh, just relax. It's just that while we're sitting in the train, we're also the locomotive. We're also the locomotive, but all the other cars in the train are push pushing the locomotive. So it's not that you alone have to fight that but You go along and the other cars uh, that push you and there's actually maybe an invisible locomotive in front of the locomotive that are the Buddhist patri patriarchs. And by just sitting uh, one period, at a time, giving your best, giving your whole, you're paying re the, repaying the debt to the Buddhist patriarchs that give you the strength, that transport you, that push you on that way. Um, okay, so that would be in a nutshell the Gyoji chapter up to this point. Before I continue to read, do you have any questions um, either about the chapter? itself or anything else you want to know. For Bushin it might be yeah, the last tea show for a couple of months, so that would be a chance to ask something also for you. Uh, you hear this Gyoji chapter tea show every month, but maybe there's something that's missing or something else that you would want to know. So. Uh, if you have any questions at this point, don't hesitate to ask before I start to read the text. Yes, please. Um, yeah, just in reference to what you're saying about kind of giving up on the Christian journey, especially. In, so, what's the difference between letting go of something and giving up? Letting go and giving up. Well, letting all go is probably the more softer, the, the less over-the-top expression. Letting go, letting go. Um, giving up is maybe a little bit stronger version. Now, like giving up, I, I in this case, I say giving up because it can occur in a situation where you're completely desperate. Uh, you give your best, you've been giving your best for quite a while. Uh, maybe you got some results out of your practice, some things changed, there's some progress. But there's one thing missing, that the crucial thing is missing, you still haven't found that one thing that you were looking for. and. It's still, yeah, it seems to be completely out of reach. And uh, you've been making so much progress, but only so much. And there seems to be this, yeah, sometimes it feels like an invisible wall that you're kind of confronting and, and you can't get 
further than that point. So you're, you're faced with this invisible wall. You can't break through. You can't even really see it. You don't see it. So what, what's, what is keeping me from getting any further than here? And, well, you could also say letting go, like, like what Uchiyama Roshi says, letting go of the thoughts and, and, and uh, letting go, but um, how do you let go? Um, like there, there's also this uh, let it go, let it go. It, it, at one point, it was a big hit in, in Japan, probably also in the West, this kind of Disney Disney movie, Frozen. And it was the, the kind of song, song in there. And the Japanese translation was kind of different from the original English text. But, I mean, there, that girl sings about letting go and probably basically what she means is I'm just going to do my thing and I don't care what the others think about it. And, uh, who cares what what the rest of the world thinks? I'm I'm gonna be me. I'm gonna be me. So it's quite different from uh, what in Zen we call would call uh, letting go. Um, but when we say letting go, probably a lot of think people think, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna let things uh, be, and I'm just gonna go with the flow. I'm gonna be myself, or, or uh, whatever. If I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat. If I'm sleepy, I'm gonna sleep. Uh, if I have to go to the toilet, I do that. That's also one way of letting go. But at this point, I'm talking about there's really nothing you can do. You get at this point where you can't do anything. You can't do anything, but you have to do something or... There's nothing you can do, but you have to do something there on the cushion. And well, I call it giving up. You could call it letting go as well, if, if you uh, prefer that word. In and one thing that's often understood when I say either letting go um, or giving up, Mm. Sometimes people are then surprised if in the next sentence I talk about acceptance or just yeah accepting reality as it is. For example, when I talk about the pain, uh, I sometimes say, well, just uh, accept it as it is. Or talking about life in general and death, uh, just take life as it is, take death as it is, take reality as it is accepted and sometimes people then uh, ask me well uh, how is that possible when you let go of things doesn't that mean that well you separate yourself from it isn't that the complete opposite of accepting um, and I'm usually a little bit surprised by that feedback before because for me it's, it's kind of natural that these Two things go together so giving up or letting go means to completely accept the situation in that moment uh, in that case it might psychologically even feel as if well this is killing me i'm never gonna get out of here alive and you accept that, that that's what i mean by giving up you accept it say so, okay if that's the case so be it so be it. Um, and another thing that might be necessary to say, if I say that, then some people are reminded of the kamikaze fighters during the Second World War, or the samurais that fought in Japan a couple of hundred years ago. And I say, okay, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to make it. I'm going <laughs> to uh, hit 
that boat with my plane and blow it all up. And that's not the attitude I'm talking about. Uh, giving up, uh, not in this way, oh, I give up, but also not this kamikaze fighter. Uh, fight until the last man, but rather it's okay. There's nothing more I can do. So I'm just gonna leave everything to the Zen. And let allow the Zen to do anything it wants to do with me. If it's gonna kill me, let it kill me. If it's gonna give life to me, let it give life to me. And see what happens. That's what I mean when I call when I say giving up. And you can call it uh, letting go as well. And it means also acceptance at the same time. Is there anything else? If not, I'm going to continue with the Gyoshi chapter. Um, in the Japanese version, it's Iwanami Bunko, and I think in the Iwanami Bunko it would be the page 369. Um, I read the Japanese text anyway. Seni no nasake aru kingin shinga no moke nao hoshasu kogo kosho no yoshimi kokoro aru wa minna hosha no nasake o hagemu. Nyorai Mujo no Shobo o Kemmon Sulu Daion Tale no Nimmen ka Wasuludu Toki Alan Kore o Wasule Zalan Isho no Shinho Nari Kono Gyoji o Futai Ten Naran Kegai Dokuro wa Shoji Shiji o Najiku Shichi Hoto ni Osame Issai Ninden Kai o Kuyo no Kudoku Nari Kaku no Gotoku Daion Ari to Shirinaba Kanalazu solo no inochi o itazura ni reilaku seshimezu. Nyose no toku o nengoro ni hozubeshi. Kore sunawachi gyoji nari. Can you lend me that English translation? So here I'm reading from the Nishijima translation. Um, simply to maintain the practice day by day. That's what I already uh, read last month. I'm going to well, start here. Simply to maintain the practice day by day. Only this is the right way to repay our gratitude. <clears throat> the principle here is to maintain the practice so that the life of every day is not neglected and not wasted on private pursuits. For what reason? Because this life of ours is a blessing left over from past maintenance of the practice. Maintenance, maintenance of the practice is Nishijima's translation of Yoji, which is the title of the <coughs> chapter. So it's the past Yoji uh, that blesses us with this life. It is a great favor bestowed by maintenance of the practice, which we should hasten to repay. How lamentable, how shameful it would be to turn skeletons whose life has been realized through a share of the virtue of the Buddhist patriarchs, maintenance, maintenance of the practice, into the idle playthings of wives and children, to abandon them to the trifling of wife and sh wives and children without regret for breaking precepts and debasing pure conduct. It is out of wrongness and madness that people give over their life 
body and life to the demons of fame and profit. Um, well, I was talking about this already last month when there was the question about the demons. Uh, so that's basically our psychology that makes us want to be famous and have profit. Fame and profit are the one great enemy. If we are to assign weight to fame and profit, we should really appreciate fame and profit. Really to appreciate fame and profit means never to entrust to fame and profit and thereby cause to be destroyed the body and life which might become a Buddhist patriarch. Appreciation of wives, children and relatives also should be like this. Do not study fame and profit as phantoms in a dream or flowers in space. Study them as they are to living beings. Do not accumulate wrongs and retribution because you have failed to appreciate fame and profit. When the right eyes of learning and practice widely survey all the directions, they should be like this, even a worldly person. And this is where today's texts start. I think uh, this fame and profit uh, part I did last month. The, with the next sentence, we enter this two days study. Even a worldly person who has any human feeling on receiving, on receiving charity, charity through gold, silver or precious goods will return the kindness. The friendliness of gentle words and a gentle voice spurs in all who have a heart the goodwill to return the kindness. What kind of human being could ever forget the great blessing of seeing and hearing the Tathagata Supreme Right Dharma? Never to forget this blessing is itself a lifelong treasure. A skeleton or a skull that has never regressed or strayed in this maintenance of the practice has, at the time of life and at the time of death equally, such virtue that it deserves to be kept in a stupa of the seven treasures and to be served offerings by all human beings and gods. Having recognized that we hold such a great debt of gratitude, we should without fail, without letting our life of dew on grass fall in vain, wholeheartedly repay the mountain-like virtue of the sacred patriarch. This is maintaining the practice. I read a little bit further on. Kono gyoji no ko wa sobutsu toshite gyoji suru wale alishi nari. O yoso shoso niso katsute the merit of this maintaining the practice is already present in us who are maintaining the practice as patriarch or buddha in conclusion the first patriarch and the second patriarch never founded a temple they were free from the complicated business of mowing undergrowth and the third patriarch and the fourth patriarch were also like that the fifth patriarch and the sixth patriarch did not establish their own temple, and Segen and Nangaku were also like that. Um, so again, Dogen Zenji says, when we practice, it's not to become Buddhas one fine day, but we are actually repaying our debt to the patriarchs that enable us to do this practice. I don't know how that sounds to your ears, but um, depending on the person, 
I don't know if you know the Shushogi. Uh, Shushogi is part of the Soto Shu Sutra books, but as we don't read the Sutra so often, uh, you probably rarely open a Sutra book here at Antaisi. Um, the Shushogi is a sutra that uh, was first edited or that came into existence only 150 years ago. That's very new. And uh, the Shushogi is made up from quotations from Dogen Zenji Shobo Genzo. And what a lot of people mm, find. Mm, how would you say, a little bit disappointing about the Shushogi is that Zazen isn't even mean mentioned once. The word Zazen doesn't even occur once. Zazen that was so important for Dogen Zenji isn't even mentioned in the whole Shushogi. It's not super long, but I mean, if you chant it, uh, I would say 15 minutes, 20 minutes, it's, it's uh, compared to the Hanya Shingo, it's a long text. Uh, I would say almost well 10 times of the volume of the Hanya Shingo. So you would expect if this is the essence of Dogen Zenji that you would hear about uh, Zazen in there. But Zazen isn't mentioned. Uh, rather, um, it starts with a sentence Bukke no ichi daiji wa shou o akirame, shi o akiramuru wa bukke no ichi daiji, ichi daiji no innen nari. Shou o akirame means to clarify life, to clarify life, to clarify death. Those are the most important things in the house of the Buddha. And um, then there are a few quotes from the Shoji chapter of the Shobo Genzo, where Dogen Zenji says that life and death in itself are nirvana. And from there, uh, a large portion of the Shogi are quotes from the later work of Dogen Zenji, um, where quite different from the young Dogen Zenji, he talks a lot about, for example, karma, and he talks about the afterlife, he talks about rebirth. Um, and in the Shushogi, um, the text continues that, well, you might die any time. Now think about all the bad karma that you have accumulated. And on the day you die, your father and mother won't help you, your wife won't help you, your kids won't help you, you're gonna, gonna be facing death alone. The only thing that's gonna go with you, that's gonna accompany you when you're dying is your bad karma uh, from old times. So what can you do? Repent. First you need to repent and then you take the precepts. Uh, take the precepts. And uh, that's kind of the central part of the Shushogi. And after that uh, come quotes from the Hotsubo Daishin chapter of the Shobo Genzo. Even though you're not saved yourself right now, you haven't uh, attained nirvana for yourself, you should arouse the mind that tries to help others. And there are four ways of a bodhisattva to help others. Uh, in Japanese, these are fuse, aigo, rigyo, doji, uh, which means to give both of your material wealth, but also of everything you know, your bodily presence, your time, share everything, let go, letting go, it means fuse, uh, to give. I go are kind words, try to help others with words. And that doesn't mean uh, that you ne have to give very difficult, uh, lengthy advice, like a, like a life coach or so. It can mean that in the morning you say ohayo gozaimasu, in the evening you say oyasumi nasai, during the day you say utsukale sama deshita. Even words like this can sometimes be a help uh, because you connect with people in this way. Ligyo means to work with others, cooperate with others, uh, do something for them. Doji means to share your life um, and share the life of the others. 
uh, those are four ways of a bodhisattva to connect uh, to his fellow living beings, which are also mentioned in the Shushogi. And then the last part of the Shushogi, there are lots of quotes from the Gyoji chapter, and especially what we talk about today, repaying the debt. Gyoji Hoon is the last fifth chapter of the Shushogi. And um, a lot of people have difficulties with the Shushogi for one thing, because Zazen isn't mentioned even once. Another thing that especially Westerners have difficulties uh, with is that the structure of the Shushogi is kind of, it's almost like Christianity. First, like here, how think about how sinful you are. Think about the sinful life you have led um, and repent. You should repent and take the precepts or in Christianity uh, would be you should baptize and uh, then you should repay your debt. Mm -hmm. Now here you, you have this life from God, and, and uh, although you're such a sinner, God has forgiven you. Uh, now you should also forgive your neighbor and love thy neighbor. And the Shushogi, the, there's, there's certain similarities, and uh, so I could imagine that maybe some of you, when, when you read, read two days, a part of the Shobo Genzo, where Dogenzo is talking about, about repaying the debt. The idea of debt might already, for some of you, for, for, for some years, kind of sound like suspicious. Why, why, why is there debt? I didn't ask to be born into this world. I didn't uh, ask anybody to be here. So, so why is there debt? Why do I have to repay anything? I don't owe any, anybody anything. Uh, isn't this a little bit like the Christian idea of original sin? That only by, be born, only by being born into this world, we already owe somebody some, something. Isn't that a strange idea? I think many of us from the West have a problem with this idea of original sin. And we are attracted to the fact that in Buddhism, we almost never hear about sin or death, and rather the opposite, that just be as you are, just be as you are, and we are already Buddhas, we just have to let go of our egos. The moment we let go of our egos, <coughs> we're already Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, there's no debt to repay. And here Dogen Zenji repeatedly talks about repaying the debt. Um, why? There's one uh, chapter in the Zui Monkey that we study here every five days that I personally find very interesting because it also kind of hits the same mark. I forgot the number um, of the chapter now, but Dogen Zenji there quotes the Chinese Zen master Dai, who was a Rinzai Zen master who lived about 100 years before Dogen. Um, Dogen says, according to Dai, you should practice like somebody who owns a fortune, like billions of dollars. He has this debt, but he has no money, no, not a penny in his pockets. And then he's faced with the situation that they tell him, now you have to pay back that debt. But I, I don't have a penny. I, I don't have a penny. I can't pay you back. You have to pay me back now. If you have this attitude, if you practice with the attitude of somebody being in that situation, it will be easy for you to attain the way, Dogen Zenji says. And he's quoting the Xinjin Mei, which is a Chinese sutra which starts with the words, the way is easy to attain. You just have to stop picking and choosing. You just have to stop comparing. Uh, just stop about uh, thinking of gain and loss. And in that moment, it will be easy for you to attain the way. So enlightenment, it's really easy. It's really easy. Just 
uh, stop picking and choosing. It's just that uh, for probably all of us, even though we hear that enlightenment is easy to attain, in, in, in practice it's not so easy. Why is it not so easy? And Dogen then just says, well, you don't have the attitude that you owe a debt. You owe billions. And you don't have a penny in your pocket. The attitude we usually have is, mm, I don't have a penny. Where's, where's my pocket money? Please, mommy, give me my pocket money. I did all my homework. Uh, sometimes even in, in Antaju, there's people who say, well, I do so much Samu and I do the Tenzo and I do 1,800 hours of Zazen a year. Why can't Antaju pay me a little pocket money? <laughs> <laughs> Why do I have to pay the health insurance out of my own pockets? I want some pocket money. And when it comes to Satori, sometimes we have the same attitude. Like I've been practicing for so many years now. Where's my Satori? Where's my Satori? And I've been doing so many sessions, I, I really give up each time and I let go of my ego. I've been letting go of my ego. I do my best to let go. Still no Satori. Where's my Satori? And Dogen would say, well, that's why you don't get your Satori. Nobody owes you a Satori. Nobody owes you pocket money. When was the last time you paid back your Satori? When did you pay back for the fact that you're here now in Antaijin? You can sit five day session every month. When did you pay back for that? Did you pay back your parents? Did you pay back anybody? And we say we're self-sufficient, so we eat our own rice, we eat our own vegetables. Well, what do we do? We, we plant a little bit in the spring and now we harvest in, in the autumn. And all the rest is done by the earth and the sun and the rain. And when did we pay back? Never. We eat and we say, hey, that's our own rice, that's our own vegetables. We never even thought about paying back anything, a penny. So if you have this attitude, like, like I never paid back anything, but I owe a billion. In that moment, it's easy to let go. I have nothing to give you. So take my body and mind if you want. You can you take everything, please. Um, I'm willing to get go of my life it's, if it's necessary. And in that moment, it's easy. That's moments is easy. So um, this concept, it might remind us of the concept of original sin in Christianity. And a lot of people are allergic against that. But well, it could be that in Christianity also this concept of original sin is there for exactly this reason. You need to let go. You need to let completely go of yourself. Otherwise, you can't live in Jesus or you can't allow Jesus to live through you. In Buddhism, would you would say, well, to be able to live as a bodhisattva, you have to let completely go. And only then will you feel this bodhisattva train that's pushing you and you're sitting actually in the train. You've been sitting there all the time. It's just that you didn't realize it because you were running and running and running and, and crying, Mom, where's my pocket money? When do I get my pocket money? I want candy, I want candy, I want candy. Uh, okay. Um, ten past seven. The text, of course, uh, still continues for quite a while, but right now we are at... Uh, Mm, point where the topic changes next is uh, Sekito Kisen, uh, so a new patriarch. Dogen Zenji has finished with Bodhidharma. He talked a little bit about the second patriarch who cut off his arm in the snow, and about the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, he says that they never bothered <laughs> to build a temple. The same is true for uh, Seigen and Nangaku from whom the Soto and the Rinzai branches stem forth. 
And then next month uh, we will talk uh, about uh, Sekito and then there's Dai Dosin, Doshin and other patriarchs. So it's still a little bit early, but again, um, if you have any questions, anything you want to know about, please feel free to ask. え、何でもいいです。から、え、日本語でもいいですし、英語でもいいですし、聞きたいことがあれば何でも聞いてください。About the threshing that I was talking about, so Ekosan is hoping to be able to do it on the third, but the weather forecast for tomorrow is kind of not clear. It might be raining, according to uh, tanky.jp that I looked on. So before you take off the cover, maybe have a look, good look at the forecast and then the sky. Maybe tomorrow is still too early on the second. Uh, the weather might improve, but... Mm, yeah, I'm not quite sure if the third is actually the best day. And according to Tenki.jp, the weather might last until the fifth, so it might be actually the fourth or the fifth might be a better option. But Ecosan will also have to yeah decide that. Sorry. Yes, please. I have a question. The question is, I always listen mm. to this, uh, what you just told me. Yes. I always find I never have a question. Good. So so I always like oh, mm. that's good. I don't say I don't understand it like but I mm. feel I don't have a question. Like I think I don't have a question. Yeah, it can be a good thing, can also be maybe not such a good thing because I mean if you have a question, even if you don't get an answer to the question, there's something that keeps you going. Mm. Um like I talked about this invisible wall. If you don't have a question, there's no wall, mm -hmm. which is maybe a good thing. Maybe you're already there. You're already in the here and now, and you're living each moment to the full. Or it could be that you haven't even, <laughs> yeah, confronted that wall. And that when, you, when you're there against that wall, there's a question you can't even express it. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, but there's something I need to get through this wall. I can't even really get a grasp on the wall. And in that moment, no answer will satisfy you, but there's a very strong question in that moment. It doesn't really feel good to be in that situation as I need to solve this question that I can't even really express. Um, but if you say, I don't have a question, good for you, <laughs> good for you. Maybe there's no war. Or maybe maybe next year you're gonna have a question. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows? I mean, the good thing about having a question is that it it keeps you awake. Mm. Like often in the sutras, that they mention this this uh, example of the. the there's a stick lying there, but it might also be a snake. You're not quite sure what it is. Um, if you have a question and it, uh, what is this, is it a stick, is it a snake, then you'll be very attentive and we will have look out for the thing. Is it moving, is it not moving? Um, your eyes are wide open. If you say a stick, that's a stick, then it already disappears out of sight. Oh, that's a stick. No question. Um, can also happen in anti At first, when you come, your your eyes are wide awake before before because everything is new to you. You have to learn how to enter the ofodo and the meals, and so then everything is new. A thousand things to learn. You're wide awake. 
But the second year, the third year, it's, it's already routine. Oh, okay, another jiggy do. Oh, another tensor rotation. And uh, again, we do this samu, that samu, that samu, that samu. There's no question anymore. There's nothing new anymore. It becomes just one more leaf in the calendar and you tear it off and then it's gone. So the good thing about having a question is it's, it really keeps you awake and it doesn't allow you to settle in this kind of business as usual mode. Mm. The dangerous thing about uh, not having a question is, yeah, you might settle in this. Okay, yeah, I've, I've heard that talk for a lot of times. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. another of these t-shirts. Huh? <laughs> another five-day session. I'm going to survive it. <laughs> I've done enough of those. <laughs> so, but yeah, good for me. If you don't have a question, I have nothing to say. <laughs> Yes, please. So, in relation to that, I mean, can you say the same thing about if you say you have a question and you're awake? Um, mm. Can you say the same thing about being doubtful? Like, if you're always, yes. maybe you've got all these doubts, or why am I here, and what am I doing? Like, mm. Is that the same type of, you know, yes. being awake? Yes. Mm. Um, uh, that's why they sometimes say in Zen, first you need a great doubt. Um, which is different from lot of, lots of doubt, like why do I have to arrange my slippers? Uh, why do I, is it so important that I switch off the electric lights after I've been uh, in the toilet? And why do we do it like this? And why can't I hit the bell in a different way? Not these doubts, but kind of the fundamental doubts. Why am I here in the first place? Who am I? What is life? And I got these 24 hours each day, each new day I got 24 hours. What what I do with this time? How am I going to use this time of my life? Um, and that's, yeah, if you have that doubt, that keeps you awake. It also keeps you restless and it's, it's not pleasant to be in that state where I need to find out, but I have no clue. Nobody gives me a satisfying answer. I've read so many books and still this doubt stays the same. Um, but it keeps you awake. Keeps you awake. Keeps you kind of, uh, how do you say, at the wall? You know, it was soccer, like that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're aiming at that ball. I need to get that ball. While in your, if you kind of have this attitude, well, there's 11 players in the game, and you know, there's others who are better uh, defenders than me, there's others who are better. It's. Uh, putting the ball in the goal and I'm going to pass it from that person to that person. But um, if I don't have the ball, I can't make any mistakes. So um, you need to, yeah, realize that well, nobody can live these 24 hours of the day for you. Like the, that's the point of the story of the Tenzo that Dogen meant in China. If I don't dry the mushrooms, Anybody else can do it. Yes, but that's my life. Um, if I don't do this job right here and now, nobody can do it for me. Or they can do it, but then it's their job and it's their life. You can't take away this life from me, the practice of my life from me. And, well, for that, again, it's helpful to have a doubt. What is this life? What is that that's happening right now?
Um, I have a question just about this chapter. Um, yes. The last part of it, he sort of concludes by saying, in conclusion, and then sort of lists the first until the sixth patriarchs and also Sagan and Nandaku. Yes. They didn't establish their own temples. Mm. I'm wondering sort of how that's connected to this repaying this debt of gratitude. And then he sort of says, in conclusion, all of these patriarchs didn't. Yeah, it seems to be a little bit artificial, artificially attached. I mean, Dogen Zenji, before that and also after that, uh, often emphasizes how poor the patriarchs were and that they didn't covet any property for themselves. They also didn't make a point of establishing a temple for themselves. Um, in the Zuimonki, Dogen Zenji goes to some length to explain why he's building Koshoji in the south of uh, Kyoto. He says, well, in, in China, it was raining through the roof and the temple administrators told the abbot, hey, we need to repair. And the abbot said, well, if it's raining through the roof, just let it sit in some other dry spot. We don't have to repair the temple only because it's raining through the roof. Dogen Zenji says, well, that's the mind of the patriarchs, that's how it should be, but right now I have some time and there's some pa pa uh, patrons that are helping me, so that's why I'm establishing Koshoji. But obviously he felt a need to explain why he would build a temple. Uh, so obviously also he was kind of maybe having questions about, well, is this actually the right thing to do there? Of course, for the Sangha, they need a place to practice. For that, we need a temple. But maybe also he felt some, well, what he would there call a demon, kind of the, this voice of the demon, hey, and now I'm establishing the uh, temple now. Now It's the first Zen temple in Japan. And <clears throat> at the time, also in Kyoto city, uh, a lot of big temples were being built. So Kenninji was already built and, and Dogen practiced there when he was young. It's possible that when he came back from China that he was actually hoping to get some position there at Kenninji. Uh, later they built Tofukuji, which today is still a big temple, but when it was first built, it was a huge complex where hundreds of monks could live. And that temple was built when Dogen Zenji was still in Kyoto and some people say maybe he had hopes somewhere that he would be invited to become the abbot but he wasn't and some people say that was also part of the disappointed that disappointment that led him to leave Kyoto we don't know if that's true uh, but it's it's well possible that I mean Dogen Zenji was also a human being and he saw that there's all these big new temples, Zen temples being built in Kyoto, and nobody asked me to become the abbot when I've been in China and I'm a drop of body and mind. And then he said, at one point, uh, let's go to Fukui, go into the mountains, basically what Bodhidharma said when the emperor didn't want to understand him in the southern Chinese capital. And uh, Bodhidharma didn't build a temple, the second patriarch didn't build a temple, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I mean, Dogen Zenji then ended up building some kind of temple, but it was in the mountains. So, so um, transmitting Buddhism doesn't mean to build a huge temple and become the abbot of some famous temple. Um, and to remind himself of that, probably, he says here, well, what I need to do now is to repay my debt to the patriarchs. And for that, it's completely unimportant how many temples I have built. If I have a temple of a huge fancy place in, in Kyoto, or if I live in some simple hut there in Fukui prefecture. Um, I could imagine, or I have the feeling that... Uh, it's also here at the text that we read today, but also in Zui Monkey and in other parts of the Shobo Genzo. Lungin Zenji is talking to himself when he's talking about this desire for fame and profit, but also this attachment to the ego. It's, of course, he's also talking to all of us, but I think he's also talking about his own life problems at that time. So 
he probably somewhere had the idea if all of these other guys who haven't even been to China, who haven't really understand Bodhi mind, they have all their big fancy temples. How come that I, <laughs> I have to go to the countryside and there's this, this patron I have that wants to build me a temple, but it's somewhere off there in the mountains where only Shika and Inoshishi live. And I don't even know if I have enough to eat for me and my disciples. But then he says, well, if Bodhidharma did it and the second patriarch and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth patriarch all did it, let's pay my, repay my debt. I have, I have no candy to, to wait for and my mom is not going to give me any more pocket money. Anything else? Let's finish. <coughs> Oh.